Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today, the man who is thoughts become things, Neil Positivity. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And for those who have wondered where the show was the last few days, unfortunately, on Tuesday, I tested positive for covid and uh, kind of knocked me on my back, to say the least. Uh, so I've been crawling my way back ever since. And today I felt like, okay, maybe I'm just strong enough. I can sit up, talk to some friends, feel a little bit better this way. And fortunately, I've got my friend Neil here, who is really good at helping to stay in that positive zone. <laughs> so good to see you. Our, by the way, Debbie G is, uh, she and, and hubby Joe are flying back from Hawaii from their trip. So they'll be joining us again next week. But uh, Neo is looking a whole lot healthier than I am. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, my friend? Life is good, man. Life is good. I, I've been combining, as always, field testing, a slew of different mental exercises and, and, and combining my better ones that I've gotten from other people and learned over the years and seeing what results I get. It's just been amazing. Uh, the results are coming in. Like I'm this this whole human code, I'm this close to cracking it, man. Ooh. <laughs> also cracking the code but yes we got amanda kate here with today with us uh all the way from australia yeah. you guys are here yeah. in an accent How you doing? <laughs> yeah i'm doing really really well it's such an honor to be here with both of you today love to have you and thank you for getting i mean people don't realize i, I think it's 7 a.m where you are right now you yeah well I've had, um, my my hair's all wet because i've just literally i got off about five did a workout had my shower and yeah Sitting here now with my coffee, ready to go. <laughs> oh, we appreciate it. That's really great of you to do that. Now, you also have, uh, well, first of all, you have a book, your most recent book. Uh, yeah. it, it kind of summarizes what my life has been lately. <laughs> it, it, I mean, the way I summarized, I, I kind of twisted what you said around. I said, divine can be messy. That's the way I titled the podcast. Yeah. But yeah. it is, right? I mean, that's, mm. you, you have to dive into the mess in order to get to the divine. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was really interesting when I was, um, well, I had a working title for the book, which is probably not appropriate for air. Um, but, <laughs> and I was like, how do I market this? Like, I, I, I love the working title. Um, but let's just give you a clue. It has the C word in it. Um, uh, so <laughs> that's why I was like, huh, it was a message I got in a meditation. So there was a reason behind that, by the way. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> interesting meditations you have. <laughs> oh, it was, yeah, it was a message from my inner wise person. Anyway, um, it was how I knew it was them, really, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I, hey, whatever I, works, you know. I'm not yeah, going to criticize. You know. It's fine with me. You know? Sometimes they have to give you messages in ways you're going to get <laughs> Apparently, it. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I was thinking, well, I'm always talking about making our human experience less messy. So that was mm. one of the hashtags I was using. And, you know, I talk about it in clinic, you know, when we're dealing through the mess of life, it's like we're pulling that gunk out of the toilet drain and going, what the hell do I do with this? You know, like... Mm. <laughs> and we're trying to make a wig out of it or something crazy. And But then, you know, messily human, yeah, it kind of hits most of it. But we all have that divine part of us. And and that's why that word is specifically first. And, I, and when I was telling it to my editor, I'm like, they need to be the three words, three full complete sentences on their own. And because that's kind of what life is. And and the messy human aspect only adds to the divinity at times. It, it helps us find those lessons that lead us to the divine. And I think that's the really important bit. And even in our messiest, least resourceful place, we are still connected to the divine because we all have that within us. So, yeah. And, and you were inspired not just to write this book, but also to pursue your, your current life course mm. um, because yeah. of experiences. Like, this so often happens, but because of experiences you had. Right. Yeah. Like give, give us like, we, we don't want to like depress everybody, but give, give no, us like a little, you know, a little 10,000 foot view kind of thing. Uh, really, really quick overview, you know, white middle class, Church of England raised girl, went through school, good grades, you know, did everything that everybody else wanted her to do and, mm. you know, really worked my ass off to please everybody else. You know, I'd put everybody else above me and ahead of me. And, you know, I was just constantly trying to prove to everybody that I was lovable enough or mm. worthy enough or whatever. And, and that, you know, led to, um, I got glandular fever just before my year 12 exams and then, you know, found myself in, in an emotionally and psychologically abusive marriage. And, mm. um, you know, as, as kind of ends up being the way. 
And then as a lot of people who have Epstein-Barr know, it does tend to lead into other autoimmune diseases. So I started looking at Hashimoto's and rheumatoid arthritis and I got chronic fatigue and that kind of knocked me on my butt around 2013, which is really when I started, you know, I guess powering forward with the work, although I sort of had my toes in the water before then Mm -hmm. and found kinesiology in 2015 and it just changed my life. It allowed me to leave my marriage in at the beginning of 2016. And I honestly have to say, I look back now and I'm going, holy crap, like I never imagined that I could be living the life that I'm living now. Now, I'm not saying everything's perfect, but I am in a loving, respectful relationship where I actually want to see my partner and spend time with him. <laughs> um, Good thing, you know, yeah. I, yeah, it is. I, mean, I never understood it before. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but all these people want to have, you know, date nights with the husband. <laughs> I didn't get it. I really didn't. My normal was, mm. I thought, you know, relationships were supposed to be hard. So I thought I was getting an A+. plus. I just didn't realize that I was not choosing the right type of hard. Now that I'm in my current relationship, I understand that a hard relationship is because you have to work at it in that positive way to keep the love and connection and respect and, you know, understand when they're having tough days and, you know, being in that supportive role and also, you know, being able to ask for support from them and that kind of tough, you know. So it was just I misunderstood, you know, and the overachiever thought I was just doing A-plus kind of work. <laughs> Well, I love the way you described it in your profile. You described yourself as a recovering, I love the way you said that, yeah. a recovering people pleaser and self-flagellator. Hell yes. <laughs> Whoa, that's rough. <laughs> it is. But, you know, in, in people pleasing, the way I look at it is we are putting everybody above us. And we are automatically putting us in, ourselves into an inferior state where we need to please everybody else and be perfect to be able to be acceptable, lovable, worthy, good enough. And that starts us off on like odd footing anyway, because we're already putting ourselves down. And the way I talk about the self-flagellating is if everybody imagined a megaphone on the top of their head, broadcasting all of what they said about themselves. Oh God. <laughs> this is that's how you know. You live in. <laughs> yeah. But that's how you know if you're self-talk is decent or not because I've got I had a client who came in and she said no my self-talk's fine I said okay so put this megaphone on your head have it broadcast to everybody we're thinking about yourself she said oh maybe it's not so good then (laughs) I'm like yeah we would not speak to anybody that we loved anybody that we hated probably even or didn't like or didn't gel with the way that we often speak to ourselves I know I was horrible to myself the the self-talk was nasty Mm. And, and for me, that is, is something that, you know, I don't do often anymore. And it it almost makes me laugh now when I do go down that route because I've practiced it so much, Mm. but that's why, again, I say I'm recovering at both of them because my natural instinct is to put myself last and put everybody else first. It is not to put my own oxygen mask on. It's not to look after myself because I, I, you know, I am that recovering rescuer, that recovering people pleaser the person who wants to make everybody happy. And, you know, let's face it, I'm, I'm not alone in the healing arts when it comes to that no. kind of behavior. <laughs> well, well, you are alone in one sense. I have not heard of anybody <laughs> using kinesiology as a rule. Well, that, that's really yeah. interesting. How'd you, do, how'd you come <laughs> upon that? Yeah, I was going to ask what that even is. <laughs> yeah, okay. And beautiful questions because in the States, kinesiology is much more the kinesiology that we have in terms of physiotherapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy. It's about the movement of muscles. Now, we take that further into the movement of energy. So we are looking at the fact that quantum physicists have proven that the universe is 4% physical matter, which means this meat suit that we're walking around in is 4% of the picture. So what's the other 96%? So many people are only looking at what this physical meat suit is doing. What am I feeling? You know, but when we're going into the other 96% of our energetic, mental, emotional, spiritual, you know, relational, financial, hormonal, transformational, metaphysical, all those different types of aspects of us, the different roles we play come into that. When we start looking at ourselves in that light, with the fact that this physical bit is such a small part of the picture. And that's what led to my chronic fatigue is it wasn't the physical stuff. 
it was all of the other stuff. It was the emotional sickness, the energetic sickness, the psychological sickness, the spiritual, oh, my God, the spiritual desolation in my body. I was crying out for something that I didn't even know existed really. Mm. And and that's what I love about kinesiology is we call it a balance when we do kinesiology because if you imagine us as an equilateral triangle where on one side we've got chemical and nutritional, we've then got structural and physical, and then we've got mental, emotional, and spiritual. Now, if one side of that triangle's out, the whole triangle collapses. So we need to bring it all back into balance and really look at the way that it all fits together and works together to allow our body to do what it naturally wants to do because our bodies innately know how to heal themselves. It's just that we ignore the signals and we don't know how to read the signals because we've been taught that we don't know what those signals are and we don't know how to read our body and that we need to defer to other people. We need to go to the doctor to tell us what's wrong with us or we need to go, you know, to a psychologist to hear what's wrong with us or we need to, you know, talk to our parents or an elder, you know, we're always told to look outside ourselves for answers. And that's what changed for me as I started going within. And I used kinesiology and I used, you know, other practitioners of different modalities to help me learn how to do that. I need to get some information on this kinesiology. <laughs> I need a 10 part YouTube series. That's what I need. <laughs> It is amazing. Look, I love the fact that it brings in lots of different bits from lots of different modalities. And so, you know, I go to my, I go to my doctor, you know, when I need to, and he tries to tell me certain things. I'm like, you've done 50 hours of nutrition, you know, work in your entire degree. I've done two and a half thousand hours. So don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I've, you know, we've touched on biochemical pathways in the body. We've touched on the precursors of, you know, that we need for creation of different hormones in the body. We look at the way that the different parts of the body interact, different systems, different organs, um, the way that the circulation moves through the body. We look at the energy systems of the body. So our chakra system, our, um, our meridian system, we use all of that stuff. So we're not just looking at it from one perspective and this is the thing you know you go to a gastroenterologist they look at that bit you go to a cardiologist they look at that bit you go to your gp and they kind of go well we'll either give you something that will poison it out because it's an it's an um not natural substance coming into the body which is effectively in, in most cases a, a poisonous substance um even though most drugs obviously have have some uses and i'm not denying that at all but the way that they come in, they want to do that. They want to burn something off or they want to cut something out. And, you know, the first time I was asked, I mean, I was going to the doctor for a long time and they're going, you are the healthiest sick person we know. I don't understand. Don't understand it. All of my blood tests were fine, but doctors are looking for not sick. They're not looking for healthy and vital. They're looking at not sick. That's, that's a big distinction. That, I mean, I don't think most people grasp how important that distinction is. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time. Mm. But when I rang, so I ended up getting a mental health plan because I thought there was something fundamentally broken with me. And I, I mean, I still remember sitting in my first session with my kinesiologist saying, I am so broken that I need to fix myself to save my marriage. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was ouch. slightly off kilter. Yeah, yeah, ouch. I hear that now. She reminded me of that years later when she was actually teaching me kinesiology and she's like, holy shit, girl. I swear it, she just went cha-ching. Like, it, it, it's a great a example. One. It's a great example, though, of beating yourself up because that's what you were talking yeah. about earlier. And, yeah. oh, my goodness, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what you're doing. Everything was my fault. Everything was yeah. my fault. You know, and I was constantly told everything was my fault, so, of course, I ended up believing it. Mm. You know, I was the reason that everything was going wrong everywhere, every time, you know, and every time I'd sort of say, hang on, but I don't think that's the case. It'd be, no, 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 it is. Yeah, you're, you're to blame for all of this. It's like, okay. So it, because I already had that bent of blaming myself, that was it. But this, this receptionist, when I was booking in to get my psychological evaluation and join this psychologist's mindfulness classes, she was the first person to say to me, who's got your back? Now, at the time, that question, I couldn't even speak to her for about five minutes because I was sobbing because mm. I'm like, nobody. Yeah. 
I have nobody standing behind me. I've, I'm, I'm holding all of this house of cards up mm. and I've crumbled. And she said to me, you know, you're under a bit of stress. We can't get you in for, you know, another three or four weeks for the, the psychologist. How about you try our kinesiologist on staff? And I'm like, look, I'm ready to try anything. Try anything, right? <laughs> Just, and again, like Neo, I'd never heard of it before. I was like, what is this voodoo bullshit? You know, I'm being <laughs> driven towards. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like I walked in for that session and Ah, oh, it just changed my life. It was so profound. She was hitting on every emotion that was in my body. And obviously, you know, we only had an hour. It wasn't like we got to, you know, solve the world. And solve right. the, I still have regular kinesiology sessions, you know. I still see coaches. I st I'm still unpacking the layers because, of course, you know, you don't get to 44 years old without a, you know, bit of baggage with you. So, you know, we're still unpacking a lot of that stuff. But... It's always going Jeez. to be unlimited unpacking. Absolutely. You know, always going to be somebody could cut you off on the highway and stir up yeah. from 10 years ago that you can't let go of. Yeah. It's amazing. I think, I think the interesting thing is, you know, I used to sort of go, everyone talks about peeling back the onion and blah, blah, blah. And I used to go, why can't we just, you know, put in the food presser and processor and be done with it? Like just <laughs> blitz that, you know. <laughs> Blitz that thing till it's gone. It, it reminds me of a line from uh, the movie The Blind Side, where, where uh, um, one of the uh, protagonists says, "Oh, well, you know, if you want to get through to him, you have to peel him like an onion." And the other <laughs> one says, "Not if you use a knife." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And God, don't you wish that was the case? With that onion, I swear, it never, it never stops. <laughs> it's true. I'm it's so really with something. you. It's one of the things about life. You know, it's, it's the learning never stops. The lessons yeah. never stop. The negative yeah. thoughts, they never stop. No. You can, you can, you know, use muscle memory to trim the fat on how often the ego or the pain body steps up, as that card mm. would say, but it's always there. He said something earlier about trying to be perfect for everybody. Yeah. And what made me really want to step out of that was I noticed I think it was in high school. I noticed that, and I didn't know about the law of attraction until I was 28. In high school, I noticed that everybody had their own definition of perfect. Mm. And for me to, it would be possible through hard work and dedication for me to fulfill everybody's idea of perfect around me. But as soon as two people got in the same room, I was yeah. screwed. And I was always in a room with multiple people, you know, playing sports. So I knew that that just wasn't going to be. And yeah. I was like, well, if life is telling me that it's just not, it's not going to work that way, then, you know, it's just, just how I think about things. And yeah. if it's like, if I'm not pleasing any of the 8.4 billion people on this earth, who's left to please me? I'm yes. the only one left. It's either them or me. So, and that's when I started doing things to please me. And I noticed an immediate, the immediate difference in the events that were unfolding and how I felt about life. I was just a happier person. <sighs> and I carried that with me the whole time. I wish I had seen The Secret. If I had saw The Secret in high school or knew about the law of attraction, oh, my God. But even that realization you've had so young is so important. Oh, my goodness. Like, I wish I'd gotten to it that soon. Oh, me too. I didn't you see know, The Secret until I, I was 50. Out. I mean, good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It was football. Like one coach wanted yeah. you to do one thing and another coach wanted you to do this. And then the, the straw that broke the camel's back was karate. Uh, one of my master instructors had a blowout with, uh, I got number three in command, basically. And it was about techniques. And when it's karate, there is no, I'm going to coach it this way. You coach it that way. The school, yeah. school, school needs to be on one accord. Um, and so, you know, stuff like that really, really opened my eyes to, mm -hmm. I can't please everybody. So I might as well just please myself while I'm here. Time is short. Yeah. People dropping like flies. Might as well have a little bit of fun, smile as much as I can do oh. all the things that cause smiling. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy I got that early on. Cause... And what a beautiful blessing yeah. for, you know, for your life, for you to understand that at high school. When most people are feeling so pressured yes. because I mean, and that's what I try and work with when I do have, you know, teenagers in the clinic is, 
a few of those different concepts. So in, in kinesiology, I will test. So I use muscle testing. So if nothing is stressing the body, the muscle can hold strong. If something is stressing the body, the muscle will give. So it cannot hold its tone. And so I will test up my best is good enough. Now for me, because that feels true, it's not going. But if somebody else, you know, who is in that perfectionist type spiral, it will test up as a no. So it will say, no, my best isn't good enough. So then you ask, is my best 100%? And usually if it said, you know, no, my best isn't good enough, of course 100% goes, hell no. But instead of going down, we're going up. So we count up. And, I mean, I've gotten to people who have been trying to please, like be 108 perfect people, 260 perfect people, 36 perfect people. 28 perfect people. You know, it is, it is like you are trying to be that many perfect people to feel like you are good enough as your one person. Now, how much stress or pressure does that put on somebody? And then I ask people, okay, yeah, hundred percent. And so when you look at it and you go, okay, if you imagine, let's take the 38 perfect people standing around you in a room and they all have their book. And let's pretend this is the rule book of perfection but it's got teeny tiny writing and a million different rules and variations of their idea of perfection on everything. How many of those rules books have the same rules? And Neo, you put it perfectly, none of them. So you are working to 38 conflicting ideas of perfection and what perfect means in each moment. And then you're trying to go, okay, so which is the most perfect and I need to be doing that, but hang on now, that can't be. And so you spend half your life in overwhelm. And you're not in your authentic self Hell no. while you're in front of those people. And the problem is when those people leave the room and you're in the shower or using the bathroom, your mind mm-hmm. is now accustomed to acting like that, that yes. other version of you, that fictitious version of you. And so now you're doing it in your off time, oh. being fake, trying to be yeah. real, thinking it's real, failing at being their perfection, because no matter what, you're not going to meet yeah. their perfection. So the failure and not meeting their perfection standard is a dark cloud hanging over you. Plus, yeah. you're not being your authentic self. Another dark cloud hanging over you. Yeah. You got a couple of dark clouds. Then you're looking at your life, wondering why things aren't yeah. what you want them to be. Yeah. And I was in that space I because know. I didn't know who I was. I had no clue who I was because I was a different me for my parents, for my sister, for my ex-husband, for my kids, for my, you know, friends. In every situation, I was a different person. I was constantly trying to swap the hats depending on who I was with. And very rarely did I feel like I was me. And that was the hardest thing coming out of this was, well, you know, I'm in my mid to late 30s and I don't even know who I am. What's the first thing you discovered that was you? That was that me. You, that you held on to. When this transformation, what's the first major thing about you that you noticed? All right, that wasn't me. I'm changing it to this. And you changed it. You loved it. And you kept it ever since. Do you know what's really interesting? I think it's that access to intuition. So the first real thing that made me go, this is not right, was I was sitting in front of a gynecologist because I'd been, I mean, everything was going wrong. I was suffering 13 days a month with my menstrual, menstrual cycle, almost half the month. And he tried to put me on antidepressants to sort it out. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Mm. I had about, I had half my time was in the middle of the month and half my time was at the end of the month. I was, I was suffering and I was not healthy. I was not well. And, and he tried to put me on antidepressants to fix it. And I'm like, my whole body went, what? (laughs) Oh my God. And that was that first real, I mean, I'd been getting red flags through my relationship since before we even got engaged, I was getting red flags, but I ignored them because, you know, relationships are supposed to be hard and this is the kind of man you should marry. And, you know, there was all these sorts of stories going on. And, and I, you know, I thought for the most part we were kind of doing all right. Um, and also I was over the other side of the world from my family. I was in the UK at the time. And so there was this distance thing and there were all sorts of other traumas playing into it. So, you know, it was by no means his fault nor mine, but I was getting red flags from very early on that the behaviours that I was dealing with then were not normal. But they also kind of were my normal at the same time, which is a bit of that weird kind of, you know, is it me? Is it them? It must be me because it's always me. <laughs> But I think that real, that real bash of intuition was what started me down the natural therapies path. And I looked back 
And I've kept seeing all those red flags, all those times that I was like, you should have left the marriage. And I, I mean, I used to be in the UK and I would have my suit bags on the bed and I would pack them and I'd be ready to walk out that door. And I'd go, I have no money because he controls it. I have nowhere to go. So I'd unpack them and they'd all be put away by the time he got home from work. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know what to do. Intuition is screaming at you. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yes. It was all the time. And I was ignoring it. And I think that's the thing now. If I get that little flutter of, oh, I stop and I listen to it. Because literally my intuition was screaming at me. It was screaming at me. I mean, it was screaming at me the whole time. Get out, get out, get out. But I couldn't because it wasn't then following that prescription that had been laid out for me. You know, you go to university, you finish uni, you get a job, you get married, you have your kids, you know, you retire, you travel, you know, (laughs) pretty much that's it. And I was just kind of waiting for the kids to get to high school and get through high school. I never liked that plan. No. The, the, oh, the, retire then vacation for one. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. I'm not gonna wait to take vacations till I'm sixty five. I wanna take them to where I can still play football on the beach. You know, uh, you know, with my kids or ride a horseback or whatever. Mm. Uh, and just get a job and plug away for twenty five oh, years. God no. Oh no. There's something something right with that plane. Yeah. It never sat right with me. And I'm glad that I stuck with that. It was, it became a mental game. You know, you got to tell you why the world and everything around you is telling you that's the way to go. And your gut's telling you you're not. This little voice is telling you you're not. You have to take that little voice and make it bigger in your mind. You got to take that voice and and scream it louder than the other ones. And the other ones are going to keep screaming all day long. So you got to, and they're up seem to be on autopilot screaming at you. This is the way to be. This is the way to be, people, TV, even when no one's talking, the standard is screaming at you and you still got to stand up and put in all that effort and scream back. Yeah. No, no, that's you. <laughs> that's y'all. Yeah. I got different plan. That, yeah. that actually illustrates beautifully from my perspective, the importance of, we have these very loud messages coming and we have this little tiny voice inside. Yeah. That, that's a really important dichotomy to understand because when you understand it that way, it becomes so easy to understand why you ignore the little voice inside. Yeah. It's because it's little. Yeah. And it, it never seemed to have any real impact before. And you don't really know what to do with it because you never really did anything with it before. So yeah. why would I listen to that? Yeah. And nobody else can hear it. And no one else can hear it. Yeah. So, yes. so if, if you say you've got it, you're crazy. The yeah. other thing is the standard. It's how people were being raised in life. They call it the American dream. This is the way to be. Everybody's on the same page. And this little voice in the back of only my head is yeah. completely opposing that. Yeah. Uh, everybody listen up, everybody at home. That little voice, yeah. only one that matters. And that's These, life. That's the life. subtitle of my book. The subtitle of my book is A Spiritual Guide to Prioritizing Internal Truth Over External Influence. Uh, And that's exactly it. It is really about, you know, when you think about it, we are built to move at walking pace unless we're running away from something that's threatening our life. Which for many of us is a lot. Yeah, well, at the moment, yeah. (laughs) But physiologically, that's how we're built. We haven't changed our physiology in however many, you know, tens of thousands, whatever years we've been around. And we're still built that way. And this is where, you know, those of us on that spiritual path keep talking about the beingness of it and the needing to slow down and the needing to get back to nature because we understand that physiology that we can't move at that pace. Yet we are hurtling around in cars at, you know, 40, 60, 80, 100 kilometres an hour we are having constant bombardment of pings and dings from our phone and lights and noises and sounds and everything coming at us all the time. And our body is constantly, oh, is that one a threat? Is that one a threat? Is that one a threat? Because mm-hmm. of our wiring and our physiology. Fight or flight, self-preservation. Yeah, exactly. You and so, and these rules, y'all. Got to get around and, these rules. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's why my heart sings when I hear you speak, Neo, because it's like, yes, exactly. We need to burn those rule books that everybody else has made for our life. And I get my my clients to bring it down to one question every moment. What is in my highest good right now? 
I like that. What is in my highest good right now? Because your highest good can never be detrimental to anybody else because we are all interconnected. So if your highest good is detrimental to somebody else, it's actually not your highest good. It's your ego speaking. You know, I ask what's in my highest good, and sometimes I don't get the answer that I would really, really like, but I get what is in my highest good. And when I act on it, everything expands. When I ignore it, uh, less good results. <laughs> There's a funny thing that goes along with that too, yeah. because it takes time yeah. and often coaching and help and so forth yeah. to, to learn to do this. But even then, when, when you're in the process of learning to do it, you're not only dealing with all those outside factors, out, outside experiences and so forth, but you're, you're learning to go inside and trust in something that you never really trusted before. And if you do it, you get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then one day, all of a sudden, something amazing happens. You find other people like you for what yeah. you're doing for yourself. Yeah. Well, that wasn't part of the original explanation that I got. I don't know about you. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. According yeah. to like, I don't know how it is in Australia, but in America, if you're looking out for number one, there is no other person looking out for number one who you guys are both have the same interests. Yeah. It's either you or me. It's a competitive, mm. either I'm going to win. Because it's power win. over. Yeah, but now yeah. with only this. Us three, all three of us can be looking out for number one and simultaneously be looking out for number one. You know, because we're doing power with and power yeah. to. I understand that if I hand, if I am holding your hands and, and we are all giving power to each other and we are having power in our interaction with each other, the raising tide raises all the boats. Mm -hmm. I am not pushing you under the waves trying to drown you to save my ass. I want to throw this in there. Mm. You said giving energy. I think you said giving energy to each other. I did this meditation uh, where the guy, it's like a guided meditation. And he mm. says, you know, picture like if you were to get electrocuted and you, mm. but you were holding hands with Walt and Walt mm. was holding hands with me, the shock mm. would go through all of us. Yeah. And he said, now imagine everyone on a planet is touching and electricity is going to flow through all of them. So he says, when you're breathing, your breath is that electricity flowing through yeah. everybody. Yeah. And so it's like a totally beautiful way of meditating. Mm. It's amazing. But what yeah. I wanted to say was, well, I, I tried a little something different. And I want to ask you about the distinguishing the voice in a second. It was so crazy. The other night I had like a visual. There was, there were two people across the room and their eyes first turned like all black, but then they turned into like, like smoky waviness mm -hmm. just in their eyes. And then it was like everybody on the whole planet, their eyes turned to smoky waviness. So it, at that point in my mind, all of their names disappeared. Everybody was just universe. We stripped it down to just universe energy. And I was like, all right, that's me that, you know, that's the one, I'm one with everybody. And I was like, this is a better way for me to, um, you know, love thy neighbor and appreciate and not hate and all this other stuff, like not hate, hate, but like hate on somebody. Like, why are you driving that Lexus? I'm not, my, <laughs> you know, that type of hate, hater rate. And, and it was cool when I sat on it for a day and it was great. It was amazing. I was able to see others in a different light as in like, let's say I just submitted some, something to uh, Puff Daddy. I'm sure you guys both know who Puff Daddy is. And in my mind, he doesn't know who I am yet. However, he does. once Puff Daddy's eyes disappear and it's wavy universe, universe knows exactly who I am. Yeah. So I can look at Puffy and say he knows who I am and be, and be real with it. And so that turned into the next day, my eyes became mm. wavy too. So now yeah. it wasn't, now it wasn't me in the universe. It yes. Became, that was, and I've been talking about being one for years. And it was never completely feel worthy, clear to me until yeah. I took my eyes and they became just the smoky waviness, mm -hmm. same as everyone else's. So it was like a total gel thing. Amanda, I always try to come up with ways to, yeah. uh, different ways of seeing things. Yeah, There's many I love exercises that. and uh, yes. that you have going on. 
I mean, not remotes, reminders. I got like 50 reminders that go off throughout the day. The many reminders I have go off throughout the day to keep me doing mental exercises and staying present and whatnot. Mm-hmm. If you change the way you view something, it's kind of like done for you. It's called yeah. like autopilot does not for you. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a great one that I'm on. It's like today's mm-hmm. like day two or three. The results have been crazy. I've been getting phone calls. I got an email from Puff Daddy staff today with uh, four, three or four different things that I got to go in and fill out. And yeah, things are moving. And it was, it was amazing because the, I've been waiting for a phone call from this guy, Joe, uh, basically since July 9th. Wow. You know, the next day he called me on the, he was the, he's the CEO of this company. He called me with the COO on the phone. We want to do a 50,000 person. They have a 50,000 person subscriber list and they want me to do a text message, inspirational text messages every morning to everybody. And they presented that to me in July and I've been waiting, you know, we talk once a month, you know, about mm-hmm. it, but we don't really make any grounds. The next day he called me. The next day out of nowhere, he just called me. It's uh, the way he does. Yeah. So it's like, see different, be different. You know, it's a, whole, it's a whole different thing. And when oh, you say see that. different, be different, you mean literally see different with different eyes. Yeah. I mean, it's literally yeah. different. Literally, 100%. Mm-hmm. I, I'm no longer these eyes. While you mm-hmm. guys have universal eyes, mm-hmm. I've gotten rid of these eyes. Mm-hmm. This flesh suit, temporary. Yeah. And it's become a whole different, it's, it's, you ask for things differently. Totally different. Cause one, the other way of asking is begging. I don't have it yet. What's it going to take? Please give it to me. It's outside mm-hmm. of me. And we know everything's made of vibrating mm-hmm. energy. To ask for something outside mm-hmm. of you is a fool's errand. Yeah. You know, you're just changing your house to look bigger, your car. Mm-hmm. To look better when you upgrade it. It's still, you know, to me, God, car and God, shelter, no matter where you at hotel, yeah. uh, staying in a trailer. So changing the way you're looking at things changes the way you ask of things, changes mm-hmm. your confidence on whether you're going to get it or not. Now that we all working on the same page, yeah. now that I don't have to work, I don't have to work against Puff Daddy's security, his secretary yeah. who doesn't, who filters a thousand, 10,000, 14,000 messages a day. I don't have to worry about getting lost in those messages. It's direct contact right here. Mm. I yeah. know you love me. I know you want you want you want to contact mm. me. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. So yeah, it's a totally and that's thing. that highest good aspect. Yeah, because it's you know it's that oneness. It's looking at everything from that oneness. It's been a trip. I can't wait. Yeah, but I, before, I don't want to go too far. Um, no, I love it. Cool. I love it. We, I'm going to go back to when we were talking about that small voice, that tiny yeah. voice. Yes. And trusting it. I'll trust this voice. It's the smallest voice. It opposes everything I've ever been taught. The thing is, distinguishing these voices. I always compare it to when you're in high school and uh, you call your girlfriend or boyfriend and they don't answer. And oh, you call yeah. them back and they're like, and then you're like, man, why didn't they answer? Am I in trouble? Are they mad at me? Did I yeah. say did I do something wrong? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And so distinguishing that intuitive voice from that BS voice that is always coming at us and 99.9% of the time is wrong. They were just in the shower. That's why they didn't answer the phone. Yeah. You know, or like these guys with Joe and them, we've been, mm-hmm. you know, they've been stalling for two, three months now. I'm starting to get downright upset about the situation when, you know, in actuality, they, you know, they had some other things they needed to put in place mm-hmm. to make this whole thing happen. And they've been working on it and loving me and looking at my videos ever since. So it's like those voices distinguishing them. Me and Walt have talked about this at least a dozen times because um, it's so it's, it's such an important subject. How is it you found? Because I, I would like for you to explain to people who haven't gotten the way yet how you got that way and how mm-hmm. you're distinguishing them today as well. Yeah. OK, so a lot of it was unpacking my old conditioning which obviously I'm still doing, you know, understanding, you know, if the other night I came in completely resentful after a long day at work, I've come in, gone to cook dinner, the pan that had been washed the night before still had, you know, I don't know, dirt in it from the night before. And I'm like, (laughs) but why did I have that reaction? Had nothing to do with the fact that the pan was dirty. It was the fact that everybody else was sitting around resting and relaxing after their long days and I came in after my long day and I'm getting ready to cook everyone dinner and blah, blah, blah. And I don't even have a damn pan to clean it in. The resentment, which is part of the envy family, 
was coming because I just wanted to take five or 10 minutes to sit down. Now, you know what? I absolutely could have, and I ended up doing so. But I felt that resentment first. And I probably let a few little, you know, Tourette'sy type things out. <laughs> you know, when I realized and slammed a few things or whatever. But you know what? It took me five minutes to reclean, you know, wash up all of the dishes actually that were there from the rest of that day. All of that sort of like it was nothing. But somebody I said, just to be clear, somebody did need a good talking to, though. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to wash the oh, dish, right. Look, it's, yeah, it's you know, but again, when you talk, when you think about Byron Katie's work, really? Whose Byron expectation Katie. is that? So Byron Katie is the one who coined the work. And so her story is fascinating, actually. Um, but she asks basically four questions. Is it true? Is it true that somebody should have washed that pan properly? Of course, you want to go, yes, it is. But by <laughs> whose version of truth? Mm. Well, it's, oh, it's true that it shouldn't have been washed improperly because the definition of washing is washing it. Well, if someone had a goal to wash it and they didn't complete it. Yeah. But that's, again, that's my expectation. And that's my stuff, not their stuff. They did a really quick job. They probably weren't even paying attention. Mm. But then you go, okay, how do I know that that is absolutely true, 100% true? Mm. How do I know that's 100% true? And I can't remember the other two questions, but basically what you end up doing is you sort of, well, you know, you're looking at the way that you sort of end up flipping that on its head. Well, I actually don't know that that's true. I don't know what the person who washed that was thinking about at the time. I don't know what their day had been like. I don't know, you know, they may not have had, may not have the eyesight I've got. Maybe they didn't see that dirt. I mean, the pan is pretty beaten up. It's I'd actually need a new pan to be fair. Um, you know, maybe they didn't see it. And so the other two questions, can't. the other two questions are important. I want to bring them they up. Are. The third one is they how do you react when you believe that it. thought? That's it. Yes. How do you react when you believe that thought? And then the fourth is, who would you be without the thought? Yes. That's it. That's it. That's it. Do you know, I do them subconsciously, and yet I forget the two, last two questions all the time. So thank you so much for I <laughs> You're welcome. Those <laughs> well, I, I have to admit, should... I, I looked it up because I remember them. You know, so I yes, have to remind myself, no. too. <laughs> we missed the second one. The first one was, is it true? What was the second one? Is it absolutely true? Oh, so the first one is it true and the second one is it absolutely true. Yeah. yeah because be when, when you ask, is it true? Of course you want to go, yes, it is. Because you're still in your righteousness. You're still in your self-righteousness. You're still in your soapbox going, hell yes, it's true. Hell yes, they should bloody wash those dishes properly. But is it absolutely true? Because let's face it, they didn't. So it's not truth. And the way she phrased it is, can you absolutely know that it's true? Yeah. Yeah. And so you're looking at 100% truth. So one of the um, comments or one of the chapters I've got in my book is about the truth having 144 sides. And if we can think about the fact that, you know, if, if you have 10 people who look at a car accident from 10 different angles, they will tell the police 10 different stories. And police mm -hmm. people know this. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, sometimes the car colour will change, the direction will change, the speed will change, the lights will, like, everything will change because of the perception of the people. And this also goes back to what we were talking about a bit about that, um, uh, like the perfectionism and things. And, and you were talking about the phone call and, you know, when you bring your girlfriend and, oh, you know, in high school and you're like, oh, shit, they didn't ring, what have I done wrong, blah, blah, blah. The way I talk about it with, you know, a lot of clients actually is that we perceive other people's perceptions of us. So we pick up all of our life experience, all of our behaviours, all of our beliefs, all of our thoughts about ourselves. We put them into the other person and then we look back at ourselves, usually with the most negative idea of ourself through them. So we are perceiving their perception of us through our own perception of self. So when we go, do we absolutely know it's true? Well, we're putting everything about us into that person. So already, how far from the truth are we? And then they are more than likely doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They are perceiving our perception of them through their perception of self that they've put into us. It's that's mind blowing. Why, that's exactly why I gave up on all of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is an amazing insight for you. <laughs> because I'm like, I keep putting the wrong things out there. You know, and it was during one of my, I do law of attraction summits 
And and it, I never forget. I looked out the window at my neighbor across the street, older guy. I think he was seventy two years old. Used to uh, fly helicopters for the Navy. I said, I wonder what he's doing right now. I don't know where. I was just like, I wonder what he's doing right now. I said, he probably was watching TV, sitting in the living room. You know, I have no clue what's going on over here. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I would love for him to be watching the summit right now, but I'm over here watering the seed, you know, giving energy off that he doesn't even know that I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done trying to guess. You know, I'm just going. Yeah. Nah. That's when the whole smoky eye thing comes into it. I'm going to give yeah. you what you're thinking. Yeah. I'm going to take the rings on what you're thinking and believe it wholeheartedly. Yeah. And, and that's what you have to do to the naked eye, to the common person. If I was to walk up to the gas station and tell the cashier this, they tell me to go fly a kite. Yeah. And it's a problem because that is what, that's the problem in society right now. Mm-hmm. That's the reason people are manifesting all kind of craziness into their life yeah. right now is because they're not taking this type of stuff seriously. And mm-hmm. it's so freaking critical. So the good. analogy I use with my clients is when my son was little, he had this beautiful little blue and green striped collared shirt and he had these little overalls on. And where, and I just remember this particular day, my mum was over from Australia and she was putting together this like obelisk for the garden that beans could grow up, you know, highly exciting. But she's got out the electric <laughs> drill and she's putting it together for me. And my son runs inside, grabs his Fisher-Price toolkit and comes out other cool brands are available by the way we're not giving a plug here Um, (laughs) No, (laughs) just by the way um you know goes and grabs that toolkit and gets his plastic drill and starts you know checking the screws that granny's you know tightened making sure they're tight enough that's the way i look at people who are using their unresourceful behaviors they haven't emerged from that amygdala programming into grown-up adult programming. They're staying in that child and teenager part of the hero's journey, not progressing through the apostasis to die, to be reborn into the young adult and mature adult side of the hero's journey. And so, you know, I kind of use the analogy that I know that everything I need to build a massive, amazing castle exists in our local hardware store. I can get bricks and timber and all sorts of stuff. I don't know how to build it yet. But I am out there, I'm looking for the tools, I'm learning how to use the things, I'm, you know, I'm curious about it all. And I know you can build castles because I've seen them before, so therefore that's what I'm working towards. And I know that if I needed to, I could learn to do that. might take me a while, but that's what I'm working on. Now, some people will drive down the road and they won't even see the hardware store. They don't even, they're like, it's not even in their vision. Others will look at it and go, not for me. Other people will go in and they like, I like the gardening section or the paint section or the this section or the that section. But I can tell you now, if I handed a power tool to my son when he was 18 months old, he'd have likely chopped his arm off or injured himself. He's not prepared for it. And that's the way I look at people who are out there acting unresourcefully. Some haven't moved away from that amygdala programming, from that early childhood programming that they have inherited from their parents and their parents and their parents and on and on. And they've also then, you know, packed on all the lifetime conditioning that those behaviours have given them. But they may not know the work exists. They may have never been exposed to it. They may be like me who was just, you know, who was getting these intuitive nudges but didn't really know what they were. And so that's the way I look at it. And what that helps me do is I see those people who are acting unresourcefully like my two-year-old's 18-month-old son. And it brings up compassion and empathy. They may not know that the hardware store exists. They may not know that it's possible to build castles. They may just go, that's too hard. I'm just going to keep on my path or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so it just helps me to understand, you know, if you love gardening, great. I will love you and I will help you build your garden to be the best garden you can. If you just love painting, let's make the most beautiful pictures we can. You know, we can kind of then, I guess, work within the realms of what they've got. But I want the people who are at least prepared to walk through the door of the hardware store they're the people i'm they're the people i'm looking for because then i can kind of show them around and eventually hopefully teach them how to use the power tools and they're going to be the ones who are going to be receptive anyway yes yeah, exactly. that's why i had to niche down when i was doing life yeah. coaching i want i only yeah. deal with people who know about the law of attraction already yeah yeah i'm absolutely. not teaching it no more that's a whole four yeah. six hours right there i'm not teaching yeah. it no more yeah. 
Absolutely. But you were asking me about my um, first forays into um, intuitive, you know, and how I understood that. So, yes, there was the unpacking of the programming, which was super, super important. But then it was also understanding, and this was mind-blowing for me, so it was understanding the different psychic senses. Now, you can call them intuitive senses, you can call them whatever the hell you want, but I'll use the the sort of psychic terms because for me they're easiest. You've got clairvoyance, which is clear seeing. That is seeing symbols and signs and things that make you go, oh, my God, yes, that. Oh, there's that reminder or a word catches your eye or, you know, you're using that that power of sight to see. You've got clear audience, which is hearing. So you might walk past people and you'll hear a snippet of their conversation and go, oh, my God, that. Or you'll turn on a radio and it'll be certain song lyrics or words that are coming out and you're like, oh, my God, what a message or whatever it is. You then have clear cognizance, which is clear knowing. That's where you just know things, mm-hmm. um, which is my strongest, by the way, and I fought against that for so long because I'm like, how do I know? Like, you can't just know things. You need to know how. Um you then have clear sentience, which is clear feeling. And then you have clear gustance and clear salience. So clear salience is clear smelling and clear gustance is clear taste. So people, I have a client who is huge on the clear, um, uh, clear salience, the smell. And so she will walk down the street and she will catch whiffs of different things. And say, for example, for me, every time I smell coffee, I can feel my grandmother present. Because she used to grind her own coffee beans and I could, I just get that beautiful scent. There's this different sort of musty scent when my grandfather's near, but I also feel his hand on my shoulder. So when he was alive, um, he, he'd be standing cooking the barbecue and I'd go and, you know, fill up his glass of red wine and take it back to him and he'd put his hand on my shoulder and we'd have a little chat. And so now when he's near, I feel him with his hand on my shoulder. And so, um, My strongest ones was the claircognizance, and I didn't like that because, again, I wanted the proof. I wanted that, you know, how do I know that? So I actually thought it was the clear feeling because I can feel what other people are going through. You know, I had a client in the other day, and he was, as soon as I touched him, I'm like, he's not told me the whole story of what's going on. But I could feel like Mentos in a Coke bottle, but the lid was still on tight. You know, it was this (laughs) kind of energetic feeling and I could feel the grief in his lungs and he'd not mentioned anything um, about that grief particularly. And, and it's because his mum's sort of, you know, heading into those, those twilight years and he's starting to the grieving process really. Um, And that only came out when, you know, I sort of touched him and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Because I could feel it in my body. And so that was the one that I used to back up this, this clear cognizance, this clear knowing. So I actually thought I was more clear sentient than clear cognizant, but then I realized that the knowing comes and then I'm feeling or I'm hearing or I'm seeing or I'm using the other senses to back it up. The Claire, um, the Claire audience has been really interesting for me. So this is what you were saying about that internal voice. So for me, when I'm getting Claire audience messages, it comes in at the back here, like really deep. It's mm. almost behind this ear. That's where I get it from. If I'm thinking it and if it's my story, it comes from here. It's much more frontal in my hearing I know that kind of probably sounds quite weird but it's like when it's a when it's a message from somebody else or from spirit or from the universe whatever you want to call it it really comes in deep through this side I don't think but, it's weird at all actually I mean I, I understand why you would say that I can see some yeah. people might say it's weird but I yeah. actually don't think it's all that weird if you just think that whenever we hear sounds we don't just hear sound generally we hear it yeah. over there or over here or over here or over here yeah. we hear it in a particular yeah. location so for you to to perceive that you're experiencing a sound in front rather yeah. than in back or whatever, what's yeah. so difficult to understand? That, that That's actually fairly yeah. straightforward in my view. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's where, but and that's the way that I can tell now when it's my my internal chatter or message from spirit. Ooh, I never thought about that. And that, that's cool that you have a, a really cool, easy um, definer that way. It it took me the longest time, and like Neo said, we've talked about this a lot. Mm. Um, It took me the longest time to be able to know which were my my, my internal being messages and which ones were my ego messages and which were messages that came from somebody next door because it really confused the heck out of me. And then uh, the one thing that that made the most sense to me, that, that proved to be the most accurate for me, 
was when I recognized that the true messages were the ones that felt really good. And I have to yes. distinguish here. They did, they weren't the ones that just felt really good because they, I wanted them to feel good. They yeah. felt good regardless of whether I wanted them to feel good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's di- uh, like, I, again, in my body, cause my class and I, I have kind of, mm, I'm developing all of those psychic senses. So to be a, you know, to be the kind of teacher I want to be, I need to be strong in at least four. So I'm kind of developing all six. Um, I'm impressed. I mean, I, I barely have maybe one or two, so you're doing great as far as well, I'm you do. <laughs> <laughs> we all have all of them, but again, we all have predominant ones. So, you know, most people will rely on one or two and they don't take the time to develop the others. Now I have naturally had the clairaudience, the clairvoyance, the claircognizance and the clairsentience most of my life. Um, I just didn't call them that and I didn't recognize them as that. And now that I'm calling them that, it's like they come quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, but again, I will feel into my body. And as you said, that, that difference in feeling, it's, it's like a soul deep feeling for me. It's like a cellular knowingness yeah. as opposed to that, that quick rush of, you know, the hit of dopamine or the, you know, it's not like a hormonal, this is amazing. This is great. I've just had a coffee, you know, kind of excitement feeling it's like this cellular excitement or this cellular knowingness that it's, i get it's, it's different yeah like, it's an embodied it takes a meditative soul to be able to feel that difference mm. the average mm. person would just think they were happy uh clairvoyance if clairsentient is feeling what would you describe clairvoyance at? which one is That's that clear seeing clear seeing so people often think with clairvoyance that it's, you know, seeing dead people and stuff. Now that is some of it for certain types of clairvoyance, but not all clairvoyance work in that way. So for me, I've always seen number repetitions or I've seen feathers on the ground or I've seen, you know, butterflies or dragonflies or like I will have these things or I will catch words on a page. Like I'll be working with a client and I'll open a book to a page and go, oh, that word. Okay. That's what I need. Here's one more feather for you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Trying to do whatever you were thinking when I just showed you that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, or I'll catch something on the wall and I'll go, oh, that word, okay. And even when I'm working with clients, I will be testing through. And the word, even though I test through a list, the word that caught my eye first, you can guarantee that's the one. Yeah, and that's and I use words. the must. Muscle- yeah, I use the muscle testing now more to prove to the client that that's the one because I now know that I could probably do it just with those other senses. But I'm still because I feel so confident. Because that, that first impression, whatever that first impression is, I don't care what sense you associate yeah. with. Yeah. I, when, I'm, when I can actually trust myself long enough to say, okay, I'm going to go with whatever that is. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me right now, but yeah. I'm just going to go with it. It plays out plays out exactly yeah. the way it should. But the moment I start second guessing it, saying, no, it can't be that. That's when I, I man, I get so messed up. <laughs> it's mm, crazy. Yeah. Do you know, I'll give you a really good example. And this is very vulnerable and honest of you. Back in April, I got an inkling that I needed to leave my clinic space. Um, mm-hmm. So I had two clinic spaces. This is my home clinic. And I got an inkling to leave my clinic space. And I was like, no, 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 I can't do that. I, I need that external clinic space to be a professional and to, you know, I've had it my whole time. You know, I've been in practice almost six years. Actually, next week, it'll be six years that I've been in practice. Wow. And, you know, for five and a half years, I've had this clinic space and I've, you know, I've had that professional outlook and all of this story. And you can hear its story. Mm-hmm. So I fought against it. I almost did not make rent at the end of last month for my business because the universe was like, why the hell did you not act on it when we gave you that inkling? (laughs) I handed in my notice. I moved my clinic home and guess what? Clients are coming back. Mm. Mm. You know, now that is, I mean, I, and it's not the first time I've done it to my business too, by the way, in, in terms of not listening to that little flutter and, and having the story override it. Now, obviously, in hindsight, I can now see that I was, I was denying the story. I was, you know, I was denying my truth. I was, you know, resisting whatever it was. You know, it wasn't in alignment. It wasn't in flow. And, and yet that was the way, you know, if you don't listen to those nudges, the universe does push you, you know, 
I had nudges for years since before I got married that this man was not the right man for me. Mm. Yet I ignored them because I was being told he was. So I believed that he was and ended up with chronic fatigue because I hadn't, I hadn't paid attention to it. So eventually the universe had to slap me down to a point where I had no choice but to do the work. I had no other choice left to me. And it was the same with this. It was like, you're not going to make rent, so how do you make this work? Well, you've got to hand in notice and you've got to fully set up at home. Now, every time I walk through my front door, because my front door is literally just through there, I walk in, I see this open door, and I'm like, oh, my God, all of my stuff is in the same place for the first time since I started practising. Mm-hmm. Like, this is phenomenal. I love it. I get so excited seeing my room set up. You know, I've got my space for coaching. I've got my space for healing. I have all of my tools in the one spot. And it's, and I feel my heart light up. That's that embodied knowing that I've yeah. done the right thing, that I'm in the right place. Yeah. You don't have to push it. It just, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Hey, we're, mm. we're running out of time. I want to make sure that uh, I, I get a couple things in here. First of all, thank you for joining us. We really oh, it's been it. magical. Not I'm really so nice. blessed for your, oh, just your connection and your love and your heart and your openness. Like it's just, yeah, been amazing. Both of you. Thank you so, so much. And Neo, by the way, that is so going to come through with Puff. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Want it. <laughs> and I want to hear about it from you. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Second thing is, uh, you mentioned the book. Um, yeah. I imagine there could be other things that people would want to contact you about. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to work with you directly. Maybe they want to read more about what you've got and so forth. How do they find you? Uh, so my website is www.amandakate.com.au and most of my, um, most of my social links are there. I think apart from my TikTok one, cause I've only just started on that. I'm having a bit of a play. So, <laughs> so That's yeah. All right. That's, That's the good. easiest place to go to, but I'm on all the socials. I do Facebook and LinkedIn and Insta and YouTube. None of them particularly consistently are well, but I'm doing all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Depending where the energy goes, I'll just go. But they're all on the kit, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, some of them have different, different handles, but I'm working on that. The, if you search for Amanda Kate Kinesiology, I'll come up. Okay. Well, what we'll do is go we'll, to my we'll website. Yeah, we'll put the uh, website yeah. address into the yeah. show notes. So that's the easiest yeah. way. And then people can yeah. find their way from there. So that's Yeah, good. exactly. So, exactly. And then the other thing I wanted to do is to tell you something that I make it a practice mm -hmm. to tell all my guests. Yes. And that is you, like so many people, have reached out and touched many people you've never met, never, never seen, never will see, never will meet. You've touched their lives in ways that you'll never know about. But you did touch their lives and you, and you helped them in ways you, you never, never heard about even and never will hear about. But I, th I think we need to be recognized for that. So I want to thank you on behalf of what you've been doing to reach out to people and what you're continuing to do on behalf of people. I want, I want to thank you on their behalf. Oh, and thank you for exactly the same. You know, all of you, both of you are just, yeah, amazing humans. And I love the work you're bringing into the world. And so, so, so grateful. We need so many more people doing this and connecting in for this and, you know, and bringing light to the world because there's a lot of shadow. And I think, you know, the more light we get, the more we can shine those lights on the shadows and, yeah, transmute them. And of course, Neil, I know, I've known all along just how, how much you bring to the table here. I mean, it's just crazy how much you yeah. bring to the table. But you just brought more of it. Thank you for, yeah. for leading. I, I wasn't, you knew I wasn't in a place where I could really do a lot of leading today. Thank you for doing the lead. I appreciate that. I got you, brother. I got you. Anything to get the message out. Yeah. Hey. And Walsh, I hope this has brought some healing and happiness for you today as well. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's like I tell everybody, I do this, call the show, the, the subtitle is Your Daily Dose of Happy. And I do that for one reason. That one reason is that I want me and my co-hosts and my guests and my listeners to all feel better by the end of the show. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, it is a successful show. And we just had yeah. a really successful show. Oh, Good. I because you're about it. to go into the weekend and you don't do shows on Saturday and Sunday. So tomorrow, find your daily dose. Go back and yeah. watch another episode of us. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank you guys yeah. very much. Thank you Thank to all you. of our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.